Welcome to Microdosing Table Talks, the world's first podcast dedicated exclusively to learning more about, you guessed it, microdosing. For those new to the community, microdosing is the practice of consuming a psychedelic substance in tiny subhallucinogenic doses with the purpose of enhancing one's quality of life. While this practice has its roots in ancient and indigenous traditions, there's still a lot to learn and a great deal of mystery to uncover. Here at Microdosing Institute, our mission is to merge and honor this ancient wisdom with the growing body of scientific knowledge. In the podcast, we'll introduce you to experts in the psychedelic space to bring you a better understanding of how microdosing can truly serve us, both as individuals and humanity at large. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a thank you to our friends at microdose.nl for sponsoring this episode. Microdose.nl is Europe's number one shop for all of your microdosing needs. For our community members based in the European Union, check out microdose.nl before your next microdosing cycle. Now, let's go ahead with today's episode. Dennis Walker is a satirist, journalist, and puppeteer who has recently pivoted into the psychedelic space after watching How to Change Your Mind on Netflix. He was immediately inspired to launch a psychedelic-focused brand and used half of his earnings from a successful Cirque du Soleil knockoff freak show to hire a world-class PR agency in LA to help cultivate an air of authority in the psychedelic renaissance. He now regularly lectures and goes on podcasts and is hoping to strike it rich when psychedelics become the new cannabis. Yes. Hi. Well, welcome, uh, Dennis, all the way from Kyoto today, right? <laughs> thank you for joining. Correct. Thank you for thank you so much for having me, Yoko Bin. Yeah, yeah. It's really great that while you are traveling the world and um, um, basically I am um, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands uh, a bit more like holding the space at the ground level, but uh, to connect with you. And um, yeah, actually, I wanted to first of all say that um, to also to everyone listening that you are one of those people in the psychedelic space that comes through my social media and that really brightens up my <laughs> my day every time I watch one of those reels, one of those videos, um, because they're so incredibly funny. And I, I think this justifies this social media addiction that most of us have <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to actually be there. I hope it justifies mm. mine too. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. And so for anyone who's listening and who doesn't know uh, Micropreneur Podcast on Instagram, Please go there now. I would say stop this podcast, go and watch some of the reels and then come back. <laughs> and then you will enjoy the rest of this conversation even more. Um, yeah. But yeah, Dennis, uh, I'd love to hear a bit more from you. I know um, that you are also someone who's been um, using psychedelics, who has been through quite a journey with it for many, many years. I don't know exactly how long, but um, um, can you just share a bit um, what your personal journey with psychedelics look like and how did that inspire you or where did it come into the picture that you might want to uh, become a content creator for this uh, space? Absolutely. I had my first mushroom experience when I was 17 years old in San Diego, California. It was quite recreational, right? This was years before this current push towards medicalization and the discussion about psychedelics and a therapeutic capacity. It was quite present within my high school community at that point. And I was very interested in this idea that a fungus or a plant could produce a state of gnosis or produce an ecstatic experience for people because I had heard accounts from my peers of people who had eaten mushrooms and gone to the beach or whatever the case may be of people sharing these really profound experiences but done in a very recreational capacity right it wasn't people necessarily setting an intention and doing a ceremony it was more like we ate two grams of mushrooms at the beach, at the bonfire or whatever. And we, you know, people sharing these experiences. So I was hearing about these accounts and I started reading more about, you know, Arrowhead forums and researching mm. online. I came across the work of Terrence McKenna and people like Jonathan Ott, right? This was 2006, 2005, around then. 
And I had some experience with cannabis, fairly limited experience, but I had pretty psychoactive experiences with cannabis, you know, small amounts leading to very profound personal experiences. So I, I approached mushrooms with this sort of lens of respect and awe of thinking about this small amount of natural fungal matter could produce an account in someone that they would, you know, go share with everyone and talk about how profound it was. And the first time I had a half eighth of mushrooms, which is 1.7 grams is how we measured it out. You know, we would mm. buy it 3.5 grams at a time from our local neighborhood dealer who also had the cannabis. We didn't have smart shops at the time, like you have in, in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands. And that 1.7 grams that I ate when I was 17 years old at the county fair uh, in a public environment was a very profound experience, but it was also such a small dose that it was very comfortable. At no point did I feel like I was, you know, being totally transported to another dimension. It was like a really sweet spot I found. And to this day, I'm a advocate for what I would call a museum dose or a mini dose, which is not quite a microdose, not quite a macro dose, but like a, a small manageable dose that can have a very powerful experience still for you. And so I had that experience. And then really since then, it's been a process of trying to understand this force and try to understand why did this small amount of natural mushrooms that nobody else really was talking about in the culture, very few isolated pockets of people in my community were talking about these. Why did that have such a profound spiritual impact on me? And, you know, I, I since then have scaled up the doses and I've experimented with different doses up to the macro range, down to the micro range. And really at that point, I was at a crossroads in my life because I was preparing to go to university, right? I was finishing high school. I was embarking on a whole new path and course of life of going away to college to a different city. And I went to college in San Francisco, which is quite uh, an epicenter of psychedelic legacy and culture. So it kind of set the stage for me, just this early mm -hmm. kind of responsible experience with a small dose of mushrooms to start asking broader questions and bigger questions about what my purpose was, you know, I, I think for anybody who's had this sort of cathartic transformational experience with psychedelics, it really leads you to question a lot of the other macro narratives in your life about what you're doing with your work, what you're doing in your circle of friends, you know, what you're pursuing with your time and energy. And I really feel like today I'm still on that path of being a 17 year old kid trying to figure out my place in the world. And I always come back to the sense of awe and respect and and surrender if you will that uh it, it's a beautiful thing to start a relationship and you know learn about what fungi can do for you and also what you can do for them starting to learn how to take care of fungi how to cultivate them learning about the organism learning how to integrate them into your community and into your life and that's essentially the long and the short of it as i started off at 17 years old and over the last 17 years or so i'm 34 now i've sort of grown in maturity to a degree and also mm. uh, grown in my relationship with them. And part of that growth is realizing that you really don't need a lot of mushrooms and you really don't need them all the time. A little bit can go a long way. And I'm a firm believer in that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And it, it really points out to the fact that it is, in fact, a relationship, right, that grows over the years and that keeps and of course it helps you also to create that relationship to yourself and to how you relate to the world and the things you do so it's it's very relational this mushroom i i think that's uh that's a really great point you're uh, you're hitting there yeah um and, and this also yeah inspires me to ask um what have you discovered for yourself about microdosing um also because yeah, it's just looking at your work and everything you produce, which I think is a massive amount. And it's also very creative and it's very like taking on new angles to, um, yeah, taking on new angles, looking for new perspectives and, and, and putting that into, putting that out there into the, um, you know, sphere. Um, yeah, did microdosing play a role in that to unlock even more creativity or, yeah, can you just talk about that? Yeah, microdosing is something I've only really heard about over the last few years. And I think, you know, it's been around, James Fadiman has been talking about it for many years, and there's been 
you know, evidence of various people throughout history taking different microdoses. It's a subject of investigation right now that people are researching. There's Rich, who I had a chance to interview Amanda Fielding of Beckley Foundation and Beckley Research at Breaking Convention in in England last month. So it's very cutting edge, right? A lot of this research that's happening. And I think the jury is still out for a lot of people. Like there's a lot of interest and in like, okay, what exactly is a microdose, right? You ask different people, like, what is a microdose? And you're going to get different answers about subperceptual or a little bit more. So it's something that really a year and a half ago or two years ago, when I started the podcast that I'm doing now, of course, there were different people working with microdosing who I was interested in having as a guest, or they, they were interested in coming on the podcast. And I've just been kind of taking little bits and pieces from all of these different people because everybody has a different philosophy. So as far as like how I've used microdosing, I've found it quite beneficial to combine with working out. And like I would go to a boxing class and I don't really like to get punched, but I like to train as a boxer. You know, boxing is like a very good workout, the jump roping, punching the bag, all of those things. And I was given maybe like a one month supply of microdose capsules that were stacked with different, uh, I think there were lion's mane and turkey tail and a few other things in these capsules. And, you know, the, the, for me, I have a sort of sense of humor about it all. And I wasn't feeling one capsule. So then they told me, well, yeah. you should double it and take two. And I thought, okay. And I, I remember at a certain point being like, am I still microdosing? I'm not sure, you know, I'm not, uh, what, what the, the threshold yeah. is. So I, I do think that it, it can be a really great way for people to come to psychedelics or to mushrooms for the first time, because I'm also aware that taking a big dose, taking even the mini dose or museum dose, as I mentioned, it's not always so functional for a lot of people's routines, right? Like if you yeah. take a mushroom dose or a ceremony, you worked at a smart shop, as you mentioned, it's really hard sometimes to integrate that into your daily life, you know, as what you, you have your routines and your work and your this and that. But I think a microdose can be a nice way to kind of learn about the psychedelics and to kind of bring them into your life without disrupting the major patterns in your life and actually using it as a way to accentuate and to improve upon some of those patterns. Yeah. Yeah, true. What I really like to um, use as an analogy as an analogy is always the um, like volume dial button. Like you can take a high dose and then you blast out all the volume kind of at once for a couple of hours. And then after that, you need to make sense and integrate all that you've just heard, which maybe was a lot. So it was very intense, but you can also dial it down and then have this microdose and have this volume on just a tiny bit, but for six weeks you know, and make a whole process out of that. But you get to, yeah, live that and experience that while you're also living your day-to-day -day life. And yeah, you can just apply your insights immediately and you can see and observe much more closely uh, with also your normal presence and awareness, or let's say that little bit of extra awareness. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And also the, and also what you said about you take either one caps, capsule or they say, well, if that doesn't work, you take two, which then is like a double dose. And yeah, we are always very careful about, you know, when we're educating, we're always like small increments. Like, yeah, start low, go slow, because you might go into that realm of actually taking a mini dose. Um, and for some people, it works well, too. Um, but yeah, I always like to say that is not really microdosing anymore. You need to be aware that then you're going for the effect. And when you're going for the direct effect, you're actually looking to have an experience on that particular moment and that particular day. And um, yeah, that can also bring up like discomfort because it's, it's not quite there, right? It's not a full-blown trip and it's also not um, keeping you at this functional level that we like so much that we are so attached to in a way. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to say it's such an exciting time to be speaking about this topic and to be learning about it, because finally, there's there's so much research that's happening, you know, and there's so many people interested in it. And I feel like we're really at this point where we've never been collectively, we've never been at this point at any time in recent memory, certainly, of so many people who are openly speaking about how these experiences have impacted their lives. And I think one of the huge upsides of microdosing specifically is that it really can be for a lot of different people. Like I'm a pretty firm yeah. believer that 
psychedelic experimentation, it's potentially very beneficial, but you have to prepare you, as you said, you have to have this sense of integration of preparation. It's a lot bigger process, you know, and, but at, with microdosing, I think that many people can use it and like, it can be immediately beneficial. And if that's something that's going to help people transition out of bad habits, maybe they have, you know, bad mm. dietary habits, maybe they have, you know, uh, they're stuck in a rut or a way, the way they think about themselves. If this is something that can help you transition out of that, that's really, really beneficial, no matter, you know, what yeah. right now the yeah. research says, because the, the research is all happening right now. Like I know there's, you know, a handful yeah. of studies, but probably more than I've more than ever before, we have active studies that are happening right now into the actual sort of clinical trials of, of what microdosing does quantitatively. Yeah. Yeah, true. And, 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 and like you say, it's so diverse. Like we have, um, we have people, researchers looking into, um, microdosing for headaches and cluster headaches, which is basically a medical issue that doesn't have any other solutions except for some psychedelics. And they're trying to figure out now what's the best way of using psychedelics for these groups without them having to go into taking super high doses because they already knew that that can work. But yeah, microdosing might be one pathway there. Then it for um, the aging brain, right? For um, for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and uh, I know that Amanda Fielding has started a study uh, that's going on now with LSD for for Alzheimer's. Uh, so I think that is incredibly promising. Um, yeah, and then there's all these other angles where, and also the researchers again, like looking into uh, how does it affect our sleep, how does it affect our overall well-being and what are the best markers here to measure that uh, <laughs> which is uh, and then there's ADHD of course um, and then there's overall depression and eating disorders and basically everywhere where we sort of get stuck in our own thinking patterns right and yeah we actually want to just find some relief from that and see what what who are we actually without those deeply ingrained uh, patterns Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm an advocate of psychedelics. I have been for many years. So, <laughs> you know, as far as I'm concerned, any way that people can meaningfully integrate psychedelics into their lives, I think it's good because they are pattern disruptors. And I think collectively and as a global society, we have a lot of questionable patterns right now, behavior patterns, addictions, things like that, even to things like technology. Something I've started to look more into is like we hear a lot about psychedelics as being addiction disruptors. But usually that's to do something with like opiates or alcohol. But what about like screen addiction? You know, what about technology? I think that, you know, there's something to be said right there is that I, I am a former high school teacher and, you know, I grew up without a phone. And then I have, you know, been through that process of seeing all of society and myself included all of a sudden have these phones in the palm of our hands. And it's, it's pretty wild to see young people specifically, kind of all yeah. people, but specifically young people glued to the phone. So I think there's a lot of other pathways and avenues about what psychedelics can potentially do if they can disrupt or reprogram behavior patterns, then it really becomes up to having skilled practitioners and guides and things like that who can say, okay, we can disrupt these patterns, but what healthy behavior patterns are we going to put in place of that? Or just yeah. because you, you know, change you change one behavior, what are you going to replace that with? And I would like to see, you know, healthier, happier people. And if psychedelics can contribute to that in some way, which there's a good amount of research that says that they might be able to, then I think, you know, we should be all hands on deck researching and, and advocating for these, but also doing so responsibly. I think we have to balance the narrative and mm -hmm. myself as someone with a media platform, I've seen it a lot. You know, I've been guilty of it before and now I'm trying to temper the narrative and say, it's not a fix all. It's not a magic bullet. And I think that sometimes we, we have to step back and say, okay, maybe, you know, a little bit goes a long way. And that's something I'm an advocate of too. It's like, I don't necessarily think that you need to be doing psychedelics, you know, every six weeks or whatever. I think that mm -hmm. maybe like one really well-placed experience could have a profound impact on someone. And, and I also want to mm -hmm. advocate for, it's okay to do it recreationally. And I know that's a fairly controversial opinion in some circles, but, uh, I'm a believer in cognitive liberty. And I think if mm -hmm. you're being safe and you're educating yourself and uh, that, that there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I stand by that. 
Yeah, yeah. And why do you think it's important to to share that here? And uh, I I will also say that with us and with our audience, um, I think this is by no means an unpopular opinion. But on the other hand, I also understand that there's still a lot of fear and stigma and uh, around safety and around doing this properly. And I can also see, as you said, um, doing one dose or a big dose or one um, very intentional microdosing cycle and that can take you really far. Uh, it's in the end, it's like how much, how much do I put into this, into my own process, into my own journey, into what I want to get out of it, into what, how deep do I want to go? That's also the amount that you get out of it, and you can keep on discovering new layers and and make new connections based off of that experience. But since we're living in this world where there are so many temptations, and if we have access to psychedelics, it's sort of tempting to do it again after uh, one month, two months, three months, or, or whatever amount of time. But yeah, but but I was curious about why why um, would you like to advocate a bit more for this recreational use? Totally. Well, I identify as a psychonaut. I have for a long time. And I like to share that, that for me, it's not a trend. It's a lifestyle. It's something that was very impactful for me. But I have also learned over time that a little bit goes a long way. And I think that's important. You know, I think in my earlier days of being a recreational psychedelic advocate and then getting into like ceremonies, I started looking too frequently for answers outside of myself. I'm thinking like, you know, and I think this is quite common for people who get sucked into yeah. like thinking about psychedelics is going to change the world. It's almost like this, this cult like reverence where you think I got to do another ceremony. I got to join that. I got to go to the Amazon. I got to do this. And, you know, it took me quite a few year, years to realize that I actually should apply the things that I learned. And, you know, maybe it wasn't about doing another ceremony or another dose. It was about like, fixing relationships in my life and, and things like that, right? So I think there is the very real risk right now because we do live in times with a lot of pressure for a lot of people, right? There's a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. So it's easy to fetishize or romanticize this idea that like, you know, I'm going to go to like the in the 60s, there were people like, I'm going to go to India, and then I'm going to find the answer. And in reality, like, that's not always the case, I yeah. think. So, Or this, um, this thing so, that was often said, sorry to interrupt, this thing that was so often yeah. said, we should just put LSD in the tap water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I that will solve that, all the world's problems. <laughs> yeah. So as far as why I advocate for recreational doses, because I think that there is a narrative that's being marketed right now that psychedelics need to be done in a medicalized capacity. And while I think that they can have tremendous medical potential, and I will never disavow that, like, I think that if someone needs to go to a therapist and do MDMA in that container, that can be a very, very valid pursuit and very meaningful. And the same with, with psilocybin or mushrooms. And we're seeing this right now with legalization in the United States, that there's like a push towards this therapeutic capacity of doing it. But the reality is for a lot of people, that's not very accessible right now. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, quite the US healthcare system is a bit different than what you have in the Netherlands. And it's not, mm -hmm. you know, the most yeah. friendly system for a lot of people. But I think that there are a lot of people who can benefit just from having a transformational momentous experience. And like, for myself, when I first had my first mushroom experience, and many since then, truthfully, that it's never been in this medicalized capacity. I've had a few sort of ceremonial experiences like in Mexico with various lineages and whatnot of indigenous healers. That is its own container. That is, And there's something very valid about that. But I feel like as far as just where we're at as a collective, where we're at as a species, that any way someone can have access to a mushroom experience, it's probably beneficial. And I say that also wanting to advocate for safety and for education. And that's kind of the lens I come at my work with is like, I want people to have access, but I also want them to have education and information. And to me, that's the number one component that the quote psychedelic renaissance is missing right now is the mm -hmm. educational component. I think that the hype is there. We know that if you eat mushrooms, you're going to feel something. We know that it's beneficial for some people. We know that it's powerful, but there's also this missing component of education about okay, what should you really do before you eat mushrooms? Or, you know, how can you put yourself in a position to have the best possible experience? And, you know, you could call that harm reduction. 
And mm-hmm. that's starting to be, you know, that's starting to happen. I'm sure you do a lot of education with your members and whatnot. But there's also, especially in the States, we do have quite a mental health epidemic right now, sort of a crisis of a lot of very difficult circumstances for a lot of people that are tied to various socioeconomic and environmental factors that I've lived through this and I've seen it, you know, having lived in San Francisco and Haight Street, Golden Gate Park, it's full of what you would call quite mentally ill or uneasy people. And I've seen irresponsible psychedelic use. And I've also seen it can have a negative impact. Now, I don't want to, I don't scaremonger. It's not a sense of fear mongering. It's more just like you want to educate people that you don't want to just go in and eat a seven gram dose just because you have, you know, two chocolate bars. Like that's not a great idea. So as far as recreational, I think it can be very powerful, but you just, we need to make sure that there's an educational component and safe community frameworks to, for people to fall into. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I I see what you mean, like talking about this whole uh, mental health epidemic and access to healthcare, like in, in general access is, is a big issue. And I think honestly, it's everywhere in the world. Like here, we have a good healthcare system, but it can still be a long trajectory with waiting lists and mismatches with psychologists and therapists until people actually get on the way, get their healing on track, right? It's, 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 it's not, it's not good. Um, And then to have access to, and what is actually the problem here, I think, is that our society is just sick, right? It is a sick society. It is an environment that is not um, set up for our personal well-being. And, you know, for on, all the, on all the different aspects, the whole rat race, the whole, you know, our time is our money, we need to work, we need to make sure that there's so many things to take care of that we often don't have the space to take care of ourselves or to to do some inquiries with ourselves, like what do I actually need and how can I sort of start taking care of those needs and... Yeah, I, I also agree with you that um, that psychedelics could be a way to get that process started and that you can do it together with others and in this safely held container that you create with the people that you trust and then you're well educated and you prepare yourselves and you set an intention and you make your own ceremony or you make your own conscious and mindful process for this, you can also really create your own container for for healing and for doing it together. So. I agree with you don't always need an expert guide or the most expertly led uh, retreat or a therapy trajectory um, that can do a lot. And I've been in those spaces, I've worked in those spaces, and I learned a lot. And there's a tremendous potential there, but it can also be recreated literally in society. Um, yeah, through this education and through, um, yeah, and, and also to going back to nature and to the more ancestral ways of doing that even though those seem to be different frameworks sometimes but the the essence is really the same it's it's community it's respect it's understanding your history it's understanding where you are coming from what your relationship is to the earth and that is basically the basis of all the relationships you will be creating in your life and and your relationship with yourself as well so from there we can really learn a lot and yeah, I'm quite excited that this information is now also becoming more and more available. So I, I think this style of education is, um, yeah, like there are online programs, there are downloadable preparation kits and integration kits. And um, yeah, this is, uh, so this is also what makes it an exciting time. And I also really hope we will keep having access and we can keep, um, yeah, widening that access for more and more people, um, including the people who are now still, yeah, somewhat under the stigma still, or still not ready, or for other reasons, because of the communities they are in, BIPOC or working class people, or countries where this is still very much illegal, and it's it's presents you all these legal risks, that they can also have access, um, yeah. And I want to commend what you're doing with Microdosing Institute, because for a lot of people, just being part of that community, a community that cares about them, that has their best interest in mind, that's going to give people what they need. And, you know, that's something that we're still working with 
we're still working towards developing in the States. There are some amazing underground communities and practitioners yeah. and people who are, who are doing that and creating those containers, but we don't quite have a legal framework for access right now. And it's something that's the subject of great debate and dispute for good reason. And my take on it is that there's always going to be mushroom use happening. And it's about mm. You have to be responsible in finding people that you trust that work for you. And you have to be selective because not everybody has everybody's best interest in mind. So I think it's very important yeah. that, you know, when you look for a facilitator or a guide or a practitioner, you really know what to look for and, you know, be able to identify certain warning signs if it's maybe not a good fit for you. And that's something that, you know, it, it's worth building relationships within your community and to the providers. And as far as like recreational use, I'll go back to that and say, like, I'm a big advocate for knowing your grower, like know the person mm -hmm. who's growing the mushrooms. Maybe you can grow them. Maybe you don't have the knowledge or the resources. Well, then it's not very difficult in a lot of places to, with a little bit of due diligence, find somebody who's growing them. And it might take a little while but in my case, you know, for many years, once I found somebody who had that relationship and I could connect with them, it made it a lot easier. And what you'll find is a lot of people who truly are compassionate and care about mushrooms and are stewards of mushrooms, they're not really in it for the money. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's something to be aware of. Like if you find someone who truly is compassionate about mushrooms and growing and education, a lot of times, you know, that's not their modus operandi or their number one goal is to make money. And so I think that's the thing we have to be careful with as it starts to move forward. And, you know, you, you and the Netherlands have a lot of experience with having a legal system and access for mushrooms, but also then truffles in the last 10 years. And in the U S now we're kind of flirting with that for the first time. And we're starting to see some of the realities uh, of what that looks like in an overtly capitalist, very large country with a, you know, very, diverse demographics and, and spread yeah. out. So it's quite an interesting time right now in the US. But the good news is that there are more people than ever who are growing mushrooms and who are creating these community frameworks for, for yeah. connecting with them and connecting with people who are passionate about mushrooms. Before we continue with the rest of the interview, I'd like to inform you on one of the programs we run at Microdosing Institute that might interest you. Our six-week microdosing intensive is the most holistic and powerful option we offer for microdosing support. 95% of participants indicate that they had a positive personal transformation in just six weeks. Additionally, many participants gained lifelong community connections and valuable tools to continue exploring and integrating insights even after the program has ended. One participant noted, the arc of the program worked well and guided us through our experiences. It was very clear from everyone sharing that we had all been through a profound process together that touched each of us deeply. To start your journey of personal transformation with microdosing, please visit the link in our show notes or head to our website. Yeah, it's it's true. Mushrooms are such a they they like I I keep on you know wondering and talking with people about what might be the agenda of mushrooms. Um, because they seem to be, yeah, inviting us so much to connect, but also want to understand more, want to understand more um, about how the mycelium network, how they connect everything, um, how they can be grown, that it's actually relatively easy. Um, yeah, so it's, it's almost like they keep on inviting us like, hey, come back, come closer to the earth, come and explore, see it for yourself, try it for yourself. Um, and yeah, James Vaderman always says the mushrooms don't know they are illegal. <laughs> so yeah, it's it seems that a lot of people start to resonate with this, and um, yeah, that's that's really great. Yeah, yeah. But this also makes me wonder. Like you mentioned a couple of times, the um, yeah, the the capitalist atmosphere and that that curiosity for what's going to happen now. Now that all these dynamics are interacting and interplaying with psychedelics uh, and this is also the topic of many of your uh, of your work and many of the content that you bring out um, yeah so but let, let's start maybe by um, I'd love to for you to explain a bit more what it is that you do and what you do is satire right so what is satire great question mm -hmm. so I 
discovered satire accidentally on purpose is what I say. And satire in its most basic definition is using exaggeration and and it's using exaggeration and social critique to offer a lens for looking at the world. So it's I think it's similar to comedy, but mm -hmm. what differentiates it from comedy is that there's there's a moral component to it. You're offering social criticism and generally generally that means punching up. That means kind of sticking it to the man, if you will, or questioning authority. And I think satire has always been a part of culture and it's always been a part of power structures throughout history. You can go all the way back to indigenous folk tales from different regions of the world. And there's different characters that appear like the fox or the coyote who oh, yeah. live outside of the norm. They're kind of like this trickster archetypal character and they teach lessons to the society and it appears throughout history. So like you have the jester and medieval times and in the actual Renaissance before the psychedelic mm. Renaissance, you have this archetype of the jester who's the only one who's allowed to criticize the king. And, you know, in a lot of traditional power structures, you can't criticize the, the king or the monarch, but the jester was allowed to do that. And it's kind of the same way across history. So it's this trickster archetype. So how I see satire is using comedy, but it's more specifically to offer social commentary. And for example, I've done stand-up comedy before. If I go up mm -hmm. on stage and I tell jokes about farts or whatever, that could be comedy. But like with satire, I think you would want to tell a joke that also, you know, questions, it, it causes people to sort of question or deconstruct some of the power structures that are in place in society. So I look at someone like Sasha Baron Cohen, Borat, right? A very well-known uh, satirist. And I look at South Park is a, you know, very popular mm. cartoon, adult cartoon. That's good satire. They're often criticizing, you know, the same things that I criticize. And there's many examples throughout history, right? Monty Python is a great yeah. example mm. in pop culture and going all the way back. So essentially I started a podcast two years ago. I have a background in media production alongside psychedelics. That was my academic path of study was media studies and media production at the University of San Francisco. And over the next decade after I graduated, I pursued that into starting my own company with my wife and doing production for various boutique companies and, you know, government agencies and things like that. And then uh, when I became confident enough to start speaking publicly about my own psychedelic experiences, which were very robust and ample at that point, you know, I was a closeted psychonaut, like a lot of people mm -hmm. were in the 2010s or whatnot. It was not really something you could speak about, at least in the United States, and expect to keep your job. You know, it had to be, yeah. it's very private. And then all of a sudden, at a certain point, everyone just decided to start talking about it. I think we kind of had enough of the way everything was going, you know, and I think that the pandemic was a big part of that. A lot of people said, okay, my whole life just got upended and disrupted, you know, things change for a lot of people. At some point, it started becoming kind of okay to speak about it. And I was sort of on the front wave of that. Like I, I started the podcast in January of 2021. So there was quite a bit of research out, you know, the Johns Hopkins studies, the Imperial College London studies, but there wasn't really many public facing like pop culture, uh, psychedelic, you know, share your psychedelic stories. And I remember it being a leap of faith where I had a few people kind of advising me, telling me, you'd be really good at doing a podcast and you'd be really good. You should share your stories and we know your stories. You should share them. I decided to do it. You know, the podcast did pretty well. And then a, a year into it, I just made a satire reel one day. I don't know what it was, but I thought, you know, I'll make a funny short video on Instagram to promote the podcast. And it went viral. It got a lot of attention and attraction. And I realized, Ooh, people like this style. You know, people like the humor, the comedy element, the satirical element, and specifically the elements of challenging this narrative of like the white man, the white science, the white capitalist, you know, planting their flags in psychedelics and saying like, we are the psychedelic renaissance. And I, I come from a community in San Diego on the border. There's a lot of Mexicans there. You know, a lot of my friends are Mexican. I've spent a lot of time in Mexico. And to a lot of people in those backgrounds and those communities, it's quite hubristic for, you know, a bunch of 
uh, Western scientists to come out and start talking about this new cure, or whatever, where they're like, hey, that's our folk medicine. You know, this is something that has been in our family for years. And they were literally burned at the stake by the church. So, you know, a lot of my satire started focusing on that, this idea of like the pompous Western man, white man who eats mushrooms and all of a sudden he's a shaman the next day. And, yeah. and you know, it's, it's kind of a thing, like, I guess I'm good at looking like an idiot, but it's quite pointed and poignant. But what I notice is it expresses a lot of the same things that people are expressing. It just does it in a way that's a little bit more approachable and palatable because there's something about humor, about satire that's disarming. You know, like if you yep. try to critique someone and you start yelling at them and arguing and leaving angry messages, that gets lost in translation. People don't want to hear that. They get defensive. Yeah. But if you come out, you know, and I'm in a speedo and I'm acting like this pompous idiot and people are laughing at me, there's something there, I think, that helps translate some of that poignancy and some of that message. So that's essentially how I got into it. And then I noticed there was interest in it. It, you know, helped what I was doing. And and uh, I had a lot to say about the subject. <clears throat> so that's essentially how I got into doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. Yeah. And it seems also like, to me, it also seems like that was just what was needed in this psychedelic space. Because I feel like in the past few years, things got a little tense in some way um, with, you know, especially all these big psychedelic companies going towards the stock market and really making plans for we're going to have this amount of, of ketamine clinics and we're going to have these amount and we're going to sort of literally, it's like this colonizing attitude um, really started to take hold. Um, and at the same time, um, yeah, all the promise and all the quest for for healing and oh, the mental health epidemic and but it's also like things get so serious and of course they need to be taken seriously. It is a lot of serious uh, matter there, <laughs> but that something I felt that something was missing and that your satire uh, that this brings a bit of lightness and it still it it also helps for us to yeah to have those mirrors and to be able to reflect on some of the aspects of this psychedelic renaissance, quote unquote, um, that some people may otherwise not have done. So, yeah, I feel like it sort of steers it all forward in a in a way with more lightness and with more, yeah, mm, hopefully you integrity. Know, that, that That's my goal is to be responsive and to grow with the community and to grow with people. I think that that's one of the angles of psychedelics that's very important is like as you as you embark on your journey, you're also connecting to a bigger community and to people and you're part of their journey now. And I think that's one of the, you know, important things to consider as we're moving forward with psychedelics is like, do we want to have these little siloed off pockets, you know, these lone actors, or do we want to, you know, join our stories together and be able to grow and evolve together? And it's, you know, I did a podcast yeah. this morning in Seoul, Seoul, Korea, I've had a very long travel day. So if I sound a little bit loopy, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I'm 15 hours into the day on my second country <laughs> today. And but the idea being that when you connect to a broader community, it helps you to evolve. And I think that's what a lot of people need. It's like we need to have our internal narratives challenged. Sometimes we need to be able to, you know, hear other perspectives. And it's something that I think psychedelics can be very powerful for is uh, forcing us sometimes to consider that maybe the way we think the world is, we're not a hundred percent correct yeah. all the time, and, yeah. and that's okay. You know, it's nobody's supposed to know everything. Yeah, yeah, and also like you know, there's always a shadow to everything we do or everything we believe or everything we think we are. There's always the shadow, like the part we haven't quite uncovered yet. And I think if you don't, and also publicly, of course, and the, the bigger our enterprises and all the movement comes, the, the bigger the shadow probably also, like proportionally. So shedding light on that publicly also, I think it prevents it from, you know, becoming like uh, bottled up and then stinky and rotting and <laughs> and <laughs> eventually exploding. So so I think it, it's really like it can, yeah, probably help with this process also in of course, in the most positive scenario, I like to look at things from the positive uh, side. Um, it also makes me wonder, though, are there any topics that are too sensitive or 
maybe even off limits or that you feel like, hmm, I would love to work with this topic, but it's actually too sensitive or I don't know how to approach it? That's such a good question because I've been pushing the boundaries so much trying to find that. And I'll give you an example. I was getting a lot of interest from people and people that I respected uh, over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago when I really started to push the satire and I started to explore these themes of colonialism or neo-colonialism, of, you know, looking at these ayahuasca centers and, you know, these foreign owned retreat centers, which is a very ubiquitous model of like mm -hmm. Europeans and Americans going to Peru and opening a center and they're paying $3 an hour to their employees while they're charging $300 a day to their guests. Like this is something that we've seen a lot. So I was kind of, that was pretty low hanging fruit because a lot of people can agree that's an exploitative model. Well, I ended up going over to Israel and making a lot of satire on the Israeli-Palestinian border, like on the actual border and calling into question some of the practices related to everything going on there. And kind of my idea was, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to study. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be bold. And it was very well received. And that's an example of something that is like quite polarizing, quite difficult. But I think what it comes down to is you have to show respect for the subject. You don't just go in charging blindly and say, I'm just mm -hmm. gonna do something to enrage people. Like you need to present a nuanced perspective, an original perspective. And if you can show that there's a lot of thought invested into it and that you're not just mm -hmm. you know blindly choosing a side to amplify division or whatever, I think that's what's made a lot of this more pointed and controversial satire successful. And that's actually what paved the way to me getting invited to do a lot of other things. And, you know, I, I don't know how much context we've provided so far, but uh, since I started the podcast and since I did that, uh, since I started making that satire and going more into it, I've been invited to a lot of international conferences now to speak. And it's been quite interesting for me to track that progression and to sort of, you know, be invited to publish with well-known outlets and to be featured in Forbes and to be featured in Rolling Stone and things like that. Like, to me, this is very surprising to sort of see my satire achieve a platform where I just got to go to speak at breaking convention on the same stage as Graham Hancock, right? And to connect and to be on the board of directors for the Psychedelic Puppet Show with Pam Criscow and connect with Paul Stamets and like these very well-known yeah. figures. I've done content with Rick Doblin. And like, this is just an example to say that like, I was pushing it to see sort of where the edges were. And then I realized that that's where a lot of the best content happens because I think that especially the larger platforms for good reason, they're quite controversy averse. You know, they don't want to uh, take on a lot of politically charged topics for a lot of reasons. And I've noticed that as an independent platform, that's almost my luxury is that I don't have to please, you know, this large demographic of, you know, this, that, or the other or stakeholders or shareholders or whatever, that I can take on a lot of these topics that maybe larger platforms are considering to be too politically charged. So I think at the end of the day, uh, I haven't quite found a topic that is not, I'm not able to take on, but the key is that I don't want to just do something for clicks or for views. I've never mm -hmm. wanted to do that. I want to do something that I feel called to provide a perspective about that I can do my due diligence, my research, and that actually presents an opportunity for nuanced discussion and debate. And that's something I'm in actively investing in right now is trying to create better forums for public debate, for healthy debate. Because I think that yeah. the political discourse, which gets mapped onto the mainstreaming of psychedelics, it's quite polarizing. You know, people are on different sides of the political aisle, capitalism versus anti-capitalism, you know, the science and medicalization versus whatever the opposite side of that is, of people saying that that's pure colonialism. These are very difficult subject areas. And I think the real thing that we're missing right now is like a respectable forum for healthy debate because social media doesn't do it. You can't no. win an argument on Twitter. I don't think you have to be able to create these containers where you can have good diplomacy and conversation. And that's something that I'm trying to bring to the movement right now is to create better forums for communication between people with divergent viewpoints. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. That's, that's such a, yeah, <laughs> such an all encompassing <laughs> vision. Yeah. And, um, hmm. 
And I think it is very much needed. Um, yeah, I actually also happen to have a background in media studies and it was always about this. It was always about where does the public debate actually take place, you know, and where can we get everyone involved um, because media are so polarized or they are, you know, not or, oh, yeah, they're not open to, um, to, to many voices, to the public voices, or you get social media where everyone is in their own filter bubble and only preaching to their own um, community. So, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like a, a quite a challenging task as well. Um, uh, I must say. Um, do you sure. do you feel? Yeah. How, how what, what do you feel like could be? Um, do you see any bottlenecks or do you see any issues? Because now that the psychedelic space is growing so much and there is, uh, you know, like uh, sometimes we also, we speak to researchers, they can be, for instance, very much in their own narrative of, you know, trying to find truth and trying to find clarity and only when it is, um, when there's proof, when there's evidence and they're studying and studying. So they can be very much on that, yeah, sort of, um, uh, what do you call it, like detail level. And then there's other people who, who are, yeah, blasting it from the rooftops and then there's the more commercial area and then there's the more political. So there's so many pathways. And um, and even on conferences, I feel like we're not quite succeeding in, yeah, I, I, I feel like it's still sort of, there is still this separation, even though you put everyone together on the conference and socially everyone is interacting, but um, professionally there seems to be different parallel tracks sometimes yeah you know i think the real concern and what we should focus on with this is like we don't want overnight so overnight authorities i think that social media encourages people to try to develop their knowledge base very rapidly about a subject and we've seen this with a lot of different things where you know everyone wants to have an opinion and that's great like you everybody's voice is important but I think that especially with something like psychedelics, you know, everybody thinks they're right. That's part of what makes my satire so easy is like, you know, everybody is so sure that they're correct. And I'm kind of one of the only people I think who's actually stepped up and said, I'm not an authority. Like, I don't really know, you know, what I, what I am interested in is creating healthy debate and presenting unique points of view, things like this. But like this idea that, I'm an authority on psychedelics is is ludicrous. And I think that mm. this is something we're seeing, especially where I'm from, is, you know, people who come for the first time, they have a ceremony. And I've seen it a lot, you know, in Mexico. I'll go back to that as an example. There's a lot of these retreats that are run by people who maybe have no real background with psychedelics. And it's just something, there's demand, there's interest. Maybe they had a powerful experience. And then they start leading retreats. And that's the kind of mentality that I think we have to really be skeptical of. Of Like, for example, in a lot of indigenous cultures, if you wanted to be a, quote, shaman or a curandero, you would need to study for like five years, right? Or in some cases longer yeah, before you yeah. would serve. There's this period of apprenticeship. But like social media and kind of our hyper capitalist culture, if you will, and I'm not anti-capitalist at all. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I, I still figuring out my views you know but like I, i'm not i'm not quite on like one side or the other but this idea that like i just had a couple of powerful mushroom experiences and now i'm gonna go start this retreat program and i'm gonna you know see how many people i can bring into it i think that's a dangerous narrative right there and we see that with the ketamine clinics which you mentioned earlier is like you know somebody uh, has a powerful experience and then they say I need to bring this to as many people as possible and then they get investors and then the next thing you know they're like okay we just opened 12 ketamine clinics and now we have to hit this target number to me that's a very dangerous way to pursue scaling psychedelics so I don't claim to have the right answers but I do think that we need to be skeptical of overnight authorities and you know like yeah. one of the first questions if you were going to get involved with the facilitator or someone one of the questions you should ask is like what's your pedigree like when did you learn this where did you learn it tell us about your experience and like if i you know heard from you that you've worked in a smart shop and you've you know been involved with this psychedelic community for over a decade like that's a little 20, bit 20 years <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it just i think that's and still an important and thing still uh, yeah and still i feel like it is continuously more like leading versus serving i think you're uh, you you very much had a point about people have done have a certain amount of experience and then they think now I th I should be leading others. 
into these experiences. And I feel like it's transitioning. The more experience you have, the more you feel like I could potentially be serving others or I could be serving this greater uh, intelligence and this greater sort of mission here on earth, it could contribute something, but I would be the servant. I would be by no means the leader, right? Um, and, and, and then you start to l also see everything you still don't know, even though you may have countless experiences, you, you focus on the things you still don't know or how every uh, experience or every time you guide a person, it is teaching you something new. So it becomes you become aware of like, oh, this field, this consciousness, this intelligence, it's so incredibly much bigger than I thought it was. So it's, it keeps on flipping that whole narrative uh, from my perspective. And, and, I, and I think that might be the thing here about psychedelics, why they are so special and why we should all um, yeah, be respectful and humble towards them, but also how they can help us like reclaim our own power if we, yeah work with them in in this way i think that humor is a superpower too and i think that psychedelics and entheogens they have their own sense of humor and yeah. like you know for a lot of people that that could be to circle back to this idea of recreational psychedelic use like how many times have you personally or you've connected with someone who have talked about like i had a mushroom trip with a friend and we just couldn't stop laughing or like i just couldn't stop yeah. laughing and like how cathartic that could be and that's something i've seen as like I think sometimes there's a tendency to like focus so much on trauma and like there's a, there's room for that. That's an important thing, but I don't think that's the only part of the story. I think that having, you know, a, a really robust sense of humor about things is generally a good skill in life, especially now. Like if you don't have a sense of humor in 2023, it's going to be pretty dark for a lot of people. I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of challenges coming along the path and, so I, I, I just, that's one of the messages I always try to impart to people is that you can develop a sense of humor. You know, you don't have to be born with it. It's not like, you know, this special gift that only some people have, like <clears throat> you can develop the sense of humor. Now, you don't want to only look at necessarily only want to make everything a joke, but I just think that that's an important skill set to develop is to learn how to indulge in humor and to recognize humor and to develop your sense of humor. Yeah. Humor as medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, I feel like, um, Dennis, that we have covered a lot of ground in this uh, conversation and um, it's very inspirational. And do you feel like there's anything that we haven't touched on yet, but that um, also calls for you to, to be shared or to, yeah, just dive in a little as a last thing? Yeah, totally. I just want to thank you so much, Jacobian, for hosting me and for all the work you're doing with Microdosing Institute. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be here. And also to everyone listening, please get in touch with me. I'm very happy to build new relationships and to see what you're working on and to share what I'm working on. And it's a collaborative effort, like everything that we're doing, everything you know going on in the psychedelic space, it's collaborative. So don't mm -hmm. hesitate to reach out to me and thank you so much. I'm just honored that you would give me a chance to, you know, share my story with your audience. Yeah, no, it's a, see, it's a, it's a total pleasure as well. And um, so lastly, then where can people find uh, the different types of content you put out and produce? Where can people go to uh, see all of that and how can they get in touch with you? Totally. I would recommend just Google Mycopreneur, M-Y-C-O-P-R-E-N-E-U-R. And thank you for saying it correctly. So many people go micropreneur. So thank you for saying micropreneur. I appreciate that. <laughs> and if you have Instagram, Instagram's probably where I'm most active, although I'm active on LinkedIn, Twitter, other things. I, I really like Instagram. So, and, and I have a website, micropreneur.com, where essentially I'm working towards building the onion of the psychedelic space, which is taking headlines from both the psychedelic community and from outside and kind of twisting them with a bit of satire. So if you want a sample size of my work, you want to see what I'm all about, you can go to mycopreneur.com or just type in mycopreneur. Yeah, yeah, please check it out. I, I can just testify. It's so refreshing and uh, it's it's so needed for, uh, like I said, not only for the humor and for seeing the lightness, but also for that bit of self-reflection that uh, that you invite us to to do here in this space. So yeah, so thank you for all, uh, all your work. And um yeah, I hope we get to connect again in some of those places or uh, or um, 
uh, conferences or uh, other events. That would be nice. Yeah. Me too. The odds are good. I'll see you out there in Amsterdam eventually. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And to you, our dear listener, thank you for exploring microdosing with us and stay curious. To keep learning more about microdosing, please subscribe to Microdosing Table Talks wherever you listen to podcasts. This is a wonderful, zero-cost way to support our initiatives at Microdosing Institute. And if you'd like to help us teach more people about this powerful practice, please consider leaving a review. Your kind words go a long way.